is Robert Muslam. I am the uh, Housing Authority Administrator for the City of Milpitas. And uh, we are putting on a nice little presentation to you today for Affordable Housing and Building Safety Month. And uh, is with me as always is my compadre, host, Mr. Bill Topp. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in the fun here. Um, I'm going to handle the portion where I get to talk about things around the house, which I think would be a little bit maybe more important to, to listen to as far as safety around the house. Um, I am the building official here at City of Milpitas. I've uh, been there about a little less than two years. I was at City of Santa Clara before that. Um, so I'm glad to be a part of this. And um, without further ado, Robert. All right, so let me trigger the presentation and we'll get the introductions and all of the sales pitch out of the way. And just confirm that you could see my screen and it is the whole screen. We good to go? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, welcome to Affordable Housing and Building Safety Month. Uh, Bill and I uh, work in the Building Safety and Housing Department. I in the Housing and Bill in Building Safety, uh, but under one umbrella and one team. Uh, and the month of May in the city of Milpitas is known as uh, Affordable Housing and Building Safety Month. And so in conjunction and in partnership with our, uh, our, our friends at SV at Home, uh, who are hosting Affordable Housing Month, we have put together uh, a, a, pre a host of presentations. Uh, we've done a couple previously this month, which uh, we can link to on, on our website. Um, but also uh, SV at Home has been putting on Affordable Housing Month throughout the month of May. And they are, are really trying to tackle um, a critical issue in terms of trying to, to get the word out about building more affordable housing, creating policy that builds more affordable housing. Um, and they have had about 35 or over 35 events throughout the month of Mar uh, May. And there's a link here that you can go to to see all of the events. And, and maybe not all of them have been recorded, but they certainly have a lot of recordings available for you to watch. If you missed any of the events that you would like to check out, please visit them. Um, and we'll put this link in the, in the chat box for you. Um, but the message here for Affordable Housing Month is that everyone deserves access to safe, stable, and affordable housing. Um, and, and this message seems to be more relevant now given what we're all going through. So um, we, we hope this information is valuable to you and, and we hope that um, if you do need some assistance, whether it is on the building safety side or is on the affordable housing side, that um, you have resources and you can reach out to us for more information. And as a shameless plug, SV at Home is, is uh, proudly presenting Affordable Housing Month, um, brought to you by their generous sponsors. And um, forget every one of the big names that you see here, but just know that the city of Milpitas is a, uh, is a proud bronze sponsor for SV at Home. Uh, and uh, we, we really enjoy our partnership with, with SV at Home and, and we continue that to, uh, we continue to, to push for, for more affordable housing in the city of Milpitas and to, to further the availability of housing throughout the region. Um, but in all seriousness, these, these, uh, these really generous uh, uh, you know, uh, cities or, or private companies have, have been supporting SV at Home um, and, and we're proud to be a part of that as well. So I think that is all, oh wait, International Code Council. Bill, can you, uh, can you give me a little 30 second on this one? This is your domain, not mine. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the International Code Council, <clears throat> uh, as this slide uh, tells you, celebrates, this is the 40th annual Building Safety Month. Uh, Milpitas, we've, we've uh, expanded that to include affordable housing. So uh, as kind of the foundation of our efforts for that month, uh, we've relied on the International Code Council to uh, provide a, a lot of uh, supporting documentation and, and, and uh, information that we can disseminate throughout the month. Each, each week of this month has a different theme. Um, so as we go through the month, this is of course the last one in the month, but this happens every year. And um, ICC has, has done an admirable job along with other associated um, agencies like uh, CalBIG, California Association uh, of Building Inspectors and CalBO, California Association of Building Officials, 
to uh, bring this forward for everybody. Um, it, it's very interesting every year. It's, it's different, but uh, um, it, it really punches up a couple of things. You know, safer buildings mean safer communities, um, which means a safer world. So having said that, uh, I think I'm done with the, the plug. So next slide. All right. Uh, okay, so we will uh, we will then now begin the presentation. So we're going to cover um, housing safety uh, and affordable housing initiatives, and I will I will start with housing affordable uh, ho affordable housing initiatives. Um, again, my my partner on the on the call here is Mr. Bill Tot, building official. Um, here is our contact information, which we will also display on the back end of the presentation. And we can uh, we will email this information out to everybody who used Eventbrite, um, and then we'll also place my information again, Robert, Housing Authority Administrator, um, and a link to our Housing Resources page, uh, which has uh, links to a lot of the information that we're going to touch on. Um, there's there's quite a bit, so um, we won't have direct links uh, to each individual item, but the Housing Resources page should should provide you the guidance that you need. Um, so just a little background as we talked about, um, you know, we do a proclamation every May to celebrate uh, building or affordable housing month. Um, but because uh, we have a strong building safety and housing department um, and the International Code Council as Bill just mentioned, um, celebrates building safety month in the month of May, the city of Milpitas has a joint affordable housing and building safety month proclamation every May. Um, and so uh, we're, we're happy to be closing out the month of May with a, a presentation that kind of fuses both of those topics together. So some of the housing initiatives that uh, I will be discussing today, uh, we have our pilot rent relief program, we have a rent review ordinance, uh, our work with Project Sentinel, um, community development block grant funds, also known as CDBG funds, uh, which are funds we get from the federal government to support low and moderate income individuals. Um, and our below market rate housing pro uh, home ownership program. So these are the, the five topics that I'll be just running through today. And I'll be going you know, a little fast because we only have an hour and, and we have two presentations. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Zoom chat um, and, and we'll make sure that we save a little time at the end for some questions. But if something comes in while we're talking, we're happy to stop and answer some questions if, uh, if they're relevant questions that we can answer. Okay. So our pilot rent relief program, this is a, a very new program that the city of Milpitas um, uh, initiated in October of 2019. Um, it provides emergency housing assistance for at-need residents. Um, in October, when we went to the city council and, and we received a $100,000 allocation from the city council to start this pilot rent relief program. Um, thankfully, in March of this year, we, and pre-COVID, uh, we received another $100,000 from the city council uh, for the pilot rent relief program. To date with now that, you know, COVID um, has has all, uh, has created a, an unnecessary burden on, on uh, you know, residents who, who are not working and, and unable to pay rent. Um, thankfully, with this program already in place, um, we have so far been able to help 38 households and over 115 Milpitas residents. Uh, many of the, the households have, have children who attend our school district, um, and, and we have been able to really prevent uh, displacement and, and homelessness within our community uh, by virtue of this program. So some of the, the high-level um, uh, recipients for the program, so who is it targeted for? Um, so our city council wanted to, to prioritize uh, families with dependent children under the age of 18, uh, especially ones that uh, are experiencing homelessness or uh, are temporarily homeless um, and, and attending our school district. Um, seniors who are uh, age 55 or older, uh, individuals with disabilities, victims of domestic violence, emancipated foster youth, um, and also Section 8 participants uh, or any other, uh, any other individual who may be living in a subsidized unit. So we want to provide we want to be able to provide assistance for these individuals if, if there is an emergency, if there is a job loss, if there is a, an unexpected hardship, um, that's what the program is designed for. It's designed to, dis, to, to prevent the displacement of these individuals. So what type of assistance do, does the rent relief program provide? 
Primarily, it, it provides rent and deposit relief. So if you're having trouble um, paying that first month's rent or deposit to get into a new place, um, we, we provide that assistance. Emergency hardship, as I mentioned, um, there, there could be a wide variety of reasons that somebody might be experiencing emergency hardship. We've, we've seen cases from people sleeping in cars to um, immediate job loss to, to being evicted. Um, so we also offer eviction prevention for non-payment of rent. Um, <laughs> domestic violence relocation. We've had a few of those cases. Uh, child and family homelessness relief. Again, um, families sleeping in cars that we've then assisted and tried to find permanent, more permanent housing opportunities for them. Um, and then really helping the housing authority and landlords bridge the gap between any kind of lengthy delays that the housing authority might, might incur uh, so that a tenant with a, a housing choice voucher um, can rent a unit in Milpitas. So we help with good faith deposits there. So again, our, our, our goal is to prevent displacement and improve housing opportunities. Um, and so that's how we've designed the program. I will say that this is a pilot program. So we're still, I think about seven months in. And so we're still, we're learning on the fly. Um, and COVID has certainly, you know, put the stress test on a lot of the, uh, on the program so far. Um, but, you know, we, we look forward to continuing this program for years to come and, and making it better as we go along. Okay, so I'll give anybody an opportunity to put in a, a question on the rent relief program, but um, I will continue on. And if I see a question pop up, then I will circle back to it. Okay. At the same time that we implemented the, the, rent, um, the pilot rent relief program, we also instituted a rent review ordinance. Um, a rent review or, our rent review ordinance allows any individual that received an increase above 5% to trigger what's called rent review. Um, and that is essentially uh, the first phase, a landlord and tenant style mediation that's administered by Project Sentinel. Project Sentinel is a nonprofit that assists um, the region with uh, fair housing work, with tenant landlord mediation and other types of assistance, legal assistance for, for individuals who don't, uh, don't have the means to, to afford legal protection. Um, and so the, the program is designed to encourage conversations between landlords and tenants um, so that alternatives to large increases may be mediated in lieu of, of just receiving a large increase and <clears throat> perhaps a tenant having to move out because they can't afford it. Um, there are many steps to this that, uh, that a tenant could go through if the, the landlord and tenant uh, mediation step does not, does not work, uh, concluding with a, a review with the rent review board if that was, if that was necessary. Um, but at this time, um, the, the, the rent increase provision of the, so the state of California has instituted a, rent, uh, uh, as a cap on rent increases. So the rent review ordinance has not seen as many cases as was initially intended. Uh, because the state imposed a, a cap on, on, on rent increases. Um, but the program is still available for City of Milpitas residents. If you receive an increase above 5%, you have the right to, to request, uh, request rent review. Um, but one of the things that the, the ordinance did do, um, which, which will last and will, um, will undoubtedly help individuals, is it provided a few clauses, which, which we, uh, we call a tenant protection language. Um, one of them is a source of income discrimination. And so uh, as an example, if, if you were a tenant and you needed rental assistance and your landlord decided uh, not to take that rental assistance provided by the pilot rent relief program, okay, let's say you came to the pilot rent relief program and you needed rental assistance and the landlord, your landlord said, uh, I don't want to take this, you know, these funds and, and if you don't pay me out of your own pocket, you know, I'm going to evict you. Well, that's, that's prohibited by this rent review ordinance, that the landlord cannot discriminate based on the type of income that you provide the rent with. So if you had a housing choice voucher, if you got rental assistance, all of those incomes are protected. Um, so that's, that's one key piece that, that we feel is very critical. The other thing is it increased the, the language on landlord retaliation. Um, so a lot of times in tenant landlord situations, there is ambivalence on the tenant's part to 
to bring an issue to the landlord for fear of retaliation. Um, the, the, the language in our ordinance now states that no, no landlord can retaliate against you for that, that an action that a landlord takes against you could be construed as retaliation in the first 180 days. Um, and so if, if you ask for rent review and you go through the process and then the landlord say raises the rent even more the next month, that could be construed as retaliation. So there's, there's a lot of nuance there. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind is that we're here to help, <clears throat> excuse me, we're here to help you identify what could be construed as landlord retaliation, what could be construed as source of income discrimination. So if you have any questions about something that you don't feel um, you know, confident about in terms of your interaction with your landlord, feel free to reach out to us. We'll connect you with Project Sentinel and we'll have a legal professional help you understand your rights. Okay, looking for the chat, no questions. I will keep it moving. So Project Sentinel, I've mentioned them a few times um, and they administer our rent review ordinance as I just mentioned. Uh, they are our landlord tenant uh, uh, mediators. So anytime we have tenant landlord issues, um, we, we refer our, our clients, our residents to Project Sentinel and, and Project Sentinel can do a legal review of the case and ensure, uh, and, and ensure that your rights are being protected. Um, in, in some cases, I can just give an ex a quick example off the top of my head. Uh, we had one tenant that before the state law that I mentioned uh, briefly in the past slide was implemented, a, a landlord Im imposed a, I want to I believe it was 80% rent increase. So it was like eight or $900. Um, and, and so Project Sentinel was able to identify that that increase was done illegally and was able to go back and request that the that the tenant's rent be reduced back to the original amount plus the allowable amount that was allowed by the state <clears throat> and that all of the funds that the tenant has since paid um, in, in overages be used as a credit moving forward. Um, and, and that's not something that a tenant would have, you know, the legal knowledge to do. And that's why we send folks to Project Sentinel to ensure that your legal rights are protected as a tenant, but also to ensure that your landlord is in, in is you know operating in accordance with state law, state and local law, right? Um, and so that's just a that's an extreme example, of course. Uh, but uh, you know that's that's what can happen when you have you know, adequate legal protection at your side. Um, and so it's critical that if you do have these these concerns about your situation, whatever the situation may be, um, that you contact us or Project Sentinel and, and speak with somebody who is knowledgeable and that can help point you in the right direction or provide you the assistance that you need. Um, finally, Project Sentinel also assists uh, the city of Milpitas with fair housing work. Um, these are, these are uh, less common cases, but I um, mean, cases where, you know, there might be more broad discrimination, um, that's where fair housing really comes in. Um, and so if, you, if you're in a situation where you feel like you are being discriminated against, um, then Project Sentinel can also help uh, with fair housing work as well. Um, so if you have any of those concerns, um, and even if you're not sure if it's, if it's a real concern or not, you just kind of want to know, is this something that I should be worried about? Um, you know, again, please feel free to reach out to us and we can put you in touch with professionals at Project Sentinel. Okay, looking at the chat, moving along. Okay, all right, so another, another affordable housing initiative um, that, that we get access to is our yearly CDBG grant. Um, and CDBG, again, stands for Community Development Block Grant. Um, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, there's a lot of acronyms here, uh, HUD, uh, it, they allocate funds to each city. They tell us, you know, how, how much money we have to spend every year and it, it changes every year, but approximately we, you know, in the last couple of years, we've, we've received about $600,000 um, and we use those funds to, to support nonprofits doing work in our community. Um, so nonprofits will apply for the funding. They'll apply for a specific amount of funding for a very specific reason. Um, and one, all of those reasons must meet a national objective. And so to, to simplify things, there are three national objectives. Um, low and moderate income persons. So the, the funds must be used to benefit low and moderate income individuals. 
Uh, they must be used to eliminate or prevent slums or blight, or they must uh, address community needs that pose a serious threat, such as disaster relief. Um, and so for, for our purposes in our city, uh, we have not really used, to my knowledge, at least in my short time in the city, uh, we have not used uh, CDBG funds for anything other than assisting low and moderate income persons. Um, we may start seeing some need for uh, disaster relief at some point if, if HUD changes their guidelines on how they view COVID-19, but that has not happened yet. So for the time being, every, everything, every dollar that the city gets has been used to benefit low and moderate income persons. Um, and so just as an example uh, of some of the accomplishments from uh, our, the last reporting year, so uh, 2018 to 2019, um, we funded 14 agencies benefiting you know, seniors, children, individuals with disability, individuals experiencing homelessness, victims of domestic violence, home repair, uh, affordable housing development, um, rental apartment rehabilitation, and in total with those funds, the city of Milpitas uh, was able to, uh, excuse me, the nonprofits that the city of Milpitas fund, funded um, benefited a total of 2,326 individuals during fiscal year 2018, 2019. Um, and so you can see that that is a, a tremendous benefit to the community. Um, and as the individual who submitted the report, there is a, there is a, a small caveat that HUD, HUD tells you that the national objective for low and moderate income individuals is, is supposed to be a minimum of 70% of, of the people that you help have to be low and moderate income. 100% uh, of the individuals that we're reporting here were low and moderate income. So we, we really maximize the, the use of those funds to help the most vulnerable individuals in our, in our society uh, and, and our residents and our neighbors and our community. So uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that and, and we look forward to uh, later this year reporting the, the accomplishments of our CBG partners uh, for 2019-2020. Um, and, you know, again, we, uh, we encourage you, the public, to, to, um, to be on the lookout for notices of public hearings so that you can come and participate and, and also provide feedback as to where you think those dollars should be spent. Um, this is very much a, a public process, and we encourage your participation to help us allocate the funds to where you, the public, feel, uh, you know, is, is best, best served for the community. Okay, so moving along, I don't think I have any questions just yet. Um, we have a below market rate home ownership program here at the city. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of explain how that happens here in, in the last bullet point, but just to kind of give you an example or just a, no, a high overview of how this works. At the moment, we have approximately 190 below market rate units. Um, and we manage a waiting list of applicants that are waiting to purchase those units. Um, we have criteria for the, for the waiting list and we have criteria for, for selecting those individuals from the waiting list. Um, but in a nutshell, as, as these below market rate units, um, so there's, there's two ways they, that, that people are selected to, to purchase. Um, A, you, you're waiting on the, on the waiting list for you know, some time, right? Two, three, maybe even four or five years. Um, but as a, an individual who purchased a below market rate unit wants to sell, then we select another waiting list applicant to, to purchase that unit as, as long as they qualify for that particular unit. Um, but also, um, ownership units are added as new projects are built. So if, uh, if you have been paying attention to anything at the city over the last couple of years, um, you may have become aware of what's called Affordable Housing Ordinance 297. Affordable Housing Ordinance 297 uh, established that any new development uh, that has 10 or more units must, must make 15% of those units affordable. And so um, this program applies solely to the home ownership program. Um, we don't manage the rental pro, uh, developments that get built, but the, the ordinance applies to both of them. The ordinance applies to any project that creates more rental housing and more ownership housing. But as the ownership housing is built, then we get to add to that 190 number that, I, that is at the top of this list. And so what that does is it allows us to select more people from the waiting list to then uh, offer to purchase those units at a below market rate 
uh, versus what a fair market property would go for. Um, our most recent sale, just to give you some examples, um, and this is again sort of somewhat of an extreme in terms of pricing, um, but our most recent sale was a one bedroom for $210,000. Um, and again, that's that's pretty extreme. However, um, that is that is the purpose of the below market rate program. It is to encourage people to um, to purchase a home, to achieve the American dream, um, and and to have a, a safe and sanitary place to live, affordable place to live relative to the expensive market that is around them. Um, and so, uh, with with our team at Building Safety. Who, um, who work diligently to process permits and plan review to make sure everything is done correctly and safely and inspect everything. Um, and the housing team who, who manages the, the, the ordinance itself, um, we, are, we are really looking forward to adding more units to the city of Milpitas that can encourage individuals on this waiting list and new individuals who want to apply um, to purchase homes and to you know, remain a part of this community for a long period of time. So, looking up and the vaudevillian cane is coming to take me out and is going to magically make bill todd appear so bill i will turn it over to you sir well bill's gonna have to unmute but we'll do that for him since he is a diva and i have to do everything for him unmute me there you go how's that Thank you again, Robert. That was well said. Gripping, I might say. Anyway, um, this isn't going to be so much. The uh, next slide will show you some horrific uh, comparisons here. Mildew versus mold. Gee, which is which? Well, it looks like on the left we have mildew, and it's um, actually uh, mold. They're both types of fungi, but but frankly, uh, mold is... is um, in the same family as mildew. Mildew is, is essentially a kind of a mold. Um, you can see just by looking at this picture that um, there's some differences. If you look at the mildew side, it's, it's more flat, kind of chalky white. Uh, mold has a tendency to grow kind of fibrously and uh, with a cavalcade of colors. Mold is black or green. Mildew is usually uh, gray or white. And you'll see uh, Mold tends to grow on food, and mildew has a tendency, you know, like bathroom walls and, and basement walls, fabric, it, it really loves uh, moisture. So um, we'll get into that a little bit later, how you can help prevent these two fellows from um, darkening your door. Next. So here's a uh, comparison chart, and like I was saying, uh, mildew is really a specific kind of mold. <clears throat> and it really doesn't have any use. Uh, whereas mold, as we all know, if you love blue cheese like I do, or if you've ever had a penicillin shot, um, that's mold. So uh, there actually is some usefulness to mold, uh, certain kinds of mold. Black mold not included. Black is, is a whole different animal and something that has to be uh, professionally remediated. Um, it's, it's a major hazard to to health and sometimes life. So uh, if you have mold in your home and you suspect that it's uh, black mold, certainly uh, please enlist a professional to do an assessment. Uh, mildew, on the other hand, is fairly innocuous and can be uh, cleaned up like with uh, you know, a, a white vinegar solution and something like that. But uh, the prevention of both of these is, is important, especially now that we're all hanging out at home more and, and um, you know, we're, our, maybe our windows are closed because we have air conditioning on lately because it's been 95, 100 degrees and things have a tendency to condensate on the walls and then form mold. That would be um, all the moisture from your cooking. So um, just make sure you ventilate and you provide uh, service for your HVAC. Like um, everybody has filters on their HVAC if you do have a central uh, system. Um, there's a whole list of things that you can do prevention-wise uh, to minimize, um, hopefully minimize the, the growth of these two characters. Next. Uh, earthquake. So we're going to jump from mold to something that's even worse. God forbid we have an earthquake while we're all sheltering at home here. Um, so 
there's one, two, three, four, five, six bullet points. This is uh, kind of the basic preparedness um, protocol. So make a plan. What does that mean? Uh, well, if you have a family, um, you should have earthquake drills. Um, you should choose a place uh, for your family to meet after quake and um, you essentially have, have some kind of an idea and, and the idea of, of drills is, is important because you'd be surprised or maybe not. Children are sponges um, and they hold on to stuff. So even if you have one or two of these, if you have small children or even teens at home, um, it doesn't hurt to go through some kind of an earthquake drill so everybody has a little bit of preparedness. Um, you secure your home by doing what? Well, if you have tall book shelves, um, you put some angle brackets to the wall, clip them, uh, so these things don't come falling down um, and, and possibly hurt somebody. Uh, earthquake insurance, that's another way to secure your house. Get a kit. You need food. So usually these kits, um, they want to provide food and other things for at least three days per person. Uh, so you'd have one gallon per day per person of water, uh, flashlight, crank radio, first aid, medication, clothes, ID, uh, all the things that would be essential really for your survival um, in an earthquake. If, you know, again, you're in a situation where you're, you're relying on somebody to come and save you and you need to maintain your existence until that happens. Um, this other one is not controversial so much as there's different thoughts on it, drop, cover, and hold on. That means that when an earthquake starts, um, convention is that you get under a table or you go to a doorway because the doorway is, is reinforced with a very large, what they call a header over it. So conventional thought was you're better off doing that than trying to run out of the house. Well, the other side of that is no, you'd, you'd rather be outside of a structure um, if you can get out quickly, like if you're near the front door or have pretty immediate access, you really should get out of the house. So it depends on who you talk to. Um, there's a proponents of just dive under some, you know, heavy furniture or, or jump in a bathtub or whatever. But um, again, with the thought in mind, if you're right at the front door, uh, don't go running in to the interior of the house. You're right at the front door, so get out. Um, check for hazards. When the shaking stops is what we're talking about. Um, if you smell gas, obviously you should definitely uh, vacate the premises, check for leaks, um, shut off any um, services that like the gas, electric, you know, flip the breaker, the main breaker. This is another good idea when you're making a plan. Um, make sure that you and others in your family know where these are. Where are our, where's the gas meter? Uh, where's the disconnect for the main, for the electric? Um, these little facts come in handy when, you, when you're faced with an earthquake and you need to shut off some of these uh, potentially hazardous um, uh, services. Stay connected. Um, you have to get to know your neighbors, um, which in these days, uh, it's a little bit more, maybe not more difficult. I see all my neighbors out walking around all the time. Maybe this is the time to get together. Uh, socially distancing and uh, get to know them a little better in that regard. Um, there's all kinds of websites, uh, alerts, sf.org, redcross.org, um, sffire.org. There's, there's a myriad of them uh, that can help you uh, stay connected. Uh, next. So while we're in our house, um, trying to get that crossword puzzle done or that enormous puzzle that spread out over your, your, uh, your dining table and all of a sudden the smoke alarm goes off. Well, that's good news. You have one and it's functional. So um, CO and smoke alarms don't help unless they're functional and you can hear them. So um, what is the most important thing to remember though when installing one of these? Uh, either a smoke or a carbon monoxide alarm. Any guesses? Think real estate. Location, location, location. So if you have a uh, three bedrooms and you have a hallway, each bedroom has to have a smoke alarm. The hallway leading to the bedrooms has to have one, and you have to have a CO alarm outside 
in the hallway that leads to the bedrooms. And there's all kinds of other requirements. City of Milpitas, like every city, has handouts that, that bullet point all of these requirements for installation, uh, location of CO and smoke alarms. Um, you should test them regularly. The common uh, uh, kind of convention is to do it when we have our change of, where we go from um, uh, uh, daylight saving and then back in the spring and the fall. So that's a good time to test them and replace the batteries. Um, carbon monoxide alarm, very, very important. If you have a house that has an attached garage where you can store a car, it's required. If you have a house with any kind of gas appliances, carbon monoxide alarms are required in various places as given in, in the building codes. Um, some can be have to be permanently wired depending, or there's some plug-in alarms that are allowed, again, depending on circumstance and the age of the house and a few other things. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is. When we're all, again, sheltering in place and we're all home more than uh, not, and we're doing things like cooking more, and please make sure that your smoke and CO detectors are, are up to snuff. Okay, next. Uh, exiting, if you have a, particularly a two level home, uh, extremely important, or if you have a basement, which out here in California, it's fairly rare, but um, make sure that you, you, you know, don't have a lot of clutter. So in the event of an earthquake, if you do try to get out of the house, or if you have a fire, God forbid, and you have to make a hasty exit, uh, it doesn't help if you have um, the kids' toys strewn about and um, your roller skates and whatever else. And so, and don't block escape windows. So what is that? Well, every bedroom has a second egress, which most people don't look as, at a window as an egress, but it is. It's an emergency egress. Every bedroom uh, or sleeping area has to have one. Um, and there's certain requirements for that window, like a, a maximum height from the floor, size of the opening for the window itself, for ingress and egress, um, if you got a fireman that needs to get in or you need to get out, but don't block those. Don't um, decide it's a really good idea to put my armoire in front of this window in my bedroom. Uh, I like it there, but um, make sure you, you've done things this way to help yourself exit safely. And again, here's your education on your family uh, to go over these things. Um, sometimes children, they don't know how to unlock a window and maybe you can't get to them. I mean, these, these are horrible scenarios and they need to know kind of basic little things like this. Um, and again, develop a escape plan. I know it sounds like something like, maybe you're rolling your eyes at this point, but again, um, you'd be surprised what people retain, especially in um, moments of, of um, panic where your training actually kicks in. So if you have had no training, then you just have panic. So we don't want that. So get some training going, get an escape plan, and you'll be much better off. Uh, next. That's me, building official Bill Todd. If you have any questions or anything related to building inspection in the city of Milpitas um, that I can help you with, please feel free. Um, there's my email, and I'd be glad to help. Yeah, so um, we'll go ahead and put these, um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and email, uh, if you registered through Eventbrite, which you probably did, we'll go ahead and email this to you afterwards so you can have our contact information and have uh, access to our resources. Um, this would be a perfect time if you have questions, uh, please ask away. Uh, looks like we have one question coming in about BMR, so I'll just wait for that and when it arrives I will attempt to answer the question. Angela, if you could just type it in the chat, that would be appreciated. So what is the process? Great question. Um, so at this time, we have an application on our website. Um, the application will go through a pretty extensive uh, request for, for, from you to, to fill out some, some information. Um, and what we generally do is um, we have um, our, our esteemed housing colleague Sarah, who's on this call as well. She'll go through the um, she'll go through the packet, make sure that it's it's complete and accurate, and then we will let you know um, if you've been uh, placed on the waiting list, what waiting list you've been placed on, 
um, and generally some some we can't provide you direct time uh, expectations because it, it varies so much um, but essentially it starts with you filling out an application and us giving you uh, the approval or denial depending on your income um, as to where you would fit on the waiting list if you are approved um, so Sarah can put a link to the application in the chat uh, and if you want to just hang on uh, for a little bit uh, you'll see that in the chat and you can go ahead and apply and at, at this point right now um, we are we, we, we usually accept applications in person or, or a lot of folks mail them in. Um, but if you have the ability to mail it in, that would be great. Um, but if you don't and you'd like to scan and email it to us, then, then we, can, uh, we can coordinate with you as well. So it looks like Sarah just put the, the link in there. So thank you, Sarah. Um, and Mandula, I hope that answers your question. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great question. What about any other questions? Please feel free to ask away. So Bill, I got a question. Sure. Um, what, what has, you, you mentioned, you kind of touched on it um, a, about the increased demand that, that folks have now because they've been staying at home. What, what, are, what are some of the concerns that, that uh, somebody should have about you know, the, the, the amount of usage in, in their residence going up so much um, during this time? Is there anything that, that is more at risk of, of failing? Like what should, they, what should a potential homeowner or resident be looking at since they're staying at home so often and using the systems in their homes more often? Right, well, um, some of the things that come up when um, you know, we're a little bit prone to power outages, I'll start with that. So they, um, maybe it's, it's somewhat romantic or whatever, you bust out the candles and, and uh, you know, I, I say, instead of doing that, why don't you find some, some electric lanterns, uh, something that's battery powered that you can use, flashlights. Uh, so people are more and more um, gathered at home and uh, they're a little distracted. Maybe they're, they're, you know, I don't know, binging on some TV shows and, and somebody has one of these candles tip over by a, one of their pet animals and, and all of a sudden you've got... Um, some conflagration in the back bedroom you know, you're not even aware of until you're choking on the smoke. So you have to be really careful. You have to be more careful and, and accountable. Like if you have children, what are they doing? Where are they doing it? Um, so it's, it's, it's really more of a, you need to be more careful, generally speaking. Um, cooking, you know, people uh, doing a whole lot more cooking at home and especially with gas appliances, which everybody loves me included, to cook with, um, if you have the opportunity to go outside and, and do more queuing, you know, barbecuing or whatever, or um, things of that nature where you're, you're not so much using your appliances inside and, and creating maybe a situation. So it's just a whole lot more use of things that we're normally doing at a lesser level that and with more people around more of the time. So we all have to be uh, more vigilant and make sure, you know, it, that everybody is, um, you know, not so much behaving, but you just got to be more vigilant as a parent, as, as just as a person. Maybe you fall asleep. I'm not a smoker. Um, I was in the Navy. Of course, everybody does that. But I haven't smoked for, you know, but um, bum that many years. It, it still happens, you know. Maybe you're falling asleep watching the TV, and you just got to be really careful. Um, you know, just the overarching umbrella is concern and care and careful and everything you do um, while we're all, you know, hanging out at home. Anything that you want to add to that, Robert? No, I think it's very well said. Um, you know, I, it's one of the things that I, I know that, um, you know, energy consumption is obviously up um, and and I don't think uh, I don't think anybody really thinks about you know, your, your, your usage rate is, is usually like, you know, high in the morning when before work and then, you know, high in the morning and then drops down during the day when you're sort of at work and then back up again um, at the end of the day. Um, but now the load could be, you know, high across the board because you're home all the time and the kids are home and everyone's home. So I, 
just it, out of curiosity, you know, what, what that's where that question was coming from. You know, mm -hmm. what, what, what were the systems mm -hmm. designed for and what are they being used for now? Were they designed to, you know, constantly be on and, and being used and used and used and what potential dangers there might be from that? So you, you answered my question fairly well, but that's where my, my thought process was. Yeah, no, know. And, and you mentioned um, extended use and, um, there is something like again we since every we got hit most of us did with uh, pretty high temperatures here these last few days so if anybody has any window air conditioners um there's something in electric code that says um you have to essentially uh, have bigger wires and and a larger capacity for uh breakers if you have extended ex use which is over three uh, three hours or more so if you have a window air conditioner that's that's chugging along for you know 16 hours, it's it's not meant to do that. The circuit it's on usually isn't meant to do that. So it can get overheated, is my point. So that's a good um, I think analogy or or example of, of something that you know the system isn't meant. Being a plug-in air conditioner that you have in your window, it's not meant to be continuous for you know 16, 18, 24 hours of use. Um, because typically the circuit that it's plugged into is just a household circuit. If you're lucky, it's a 20 amp, um, more likely a 15. And uh, yeah, so that could be a recipe uh, for a disaster, a fire or whatever. But generally speaking, um, it, it's not the length of, of use so much as it is, you know, the more you use something, um, like say your gas burners on your stove, and we all get a little complacent, maybe a little hurried, and we just got to be more vigilant because we're using it more. We just got to make sure that it's shut off completely and, and everything's safe. Yep. Great point. Great point. Okay. Uh, I thought I was going to have a question about low income rentals. So I'll, uh, I don't have the question, but I'll just kind of touch on it. Um, so the low income rentals is always a, a question that we get, you know, what, where, where can I find low income rentals? And, and so um, as I was talking about, affordable housing ordinance 297 and how we develop new uh, new rental and new ownership developments and how the city um, mandates that any development above 10 units 10 units or greater that 15 percent of those units be designated for affordable housing um, and i won't get into levels of affordability i'm just trying to make this very high level um, but so i mentioned that that we are in a, in a development that intends to sell those properties to individuals. So what's called an ownership development that the city assists in placing folks from our waiting list into those below market rate home ownership units. Okay. But on the rental side, when the developments are done, the city does not get involved in the renting of the units, all of the rental below market rate units, all of those units are managed by on-site property management that the ownership group who made the, who created the development that they assigned for those particular developments. And so, whereas for the below market rate home ownership program, there's one waiting list, one, one managed waiting list uh, that the city manages for, for all of the units across all of the different developments, but for the rental below market rate units, there's a waiting list per development and so it it's it's a little bit more you know labor intensive on your side but but essentially it's your job to go to every one of those developments and and apply and put your name on the waiting list um, and some of those developments might have further restrictions like you know seniors or or really extremely low income that that may prevent you uh, in your current situation from from applying um, but if uh if the, the, the answer that I always give individuals that are asking about um, you know, low income rentals is find, you know, we have a list and we can link to that list as well. Um, find the ones, uh, you know, call all of them, ask them what their criteria is for applying and the ones that you can apply to, just put your name on those waiting lists. Um, and, and it is a waiting game, unfortunately, as, as you know, affordable housing is, is very rare um, in, in the grand scheme of all of the housing available to you in the city. Um, but, you know, at, at some point that time on the waiting list will pay dividends. And so uh, I always just encourage people to apply. I, I do the same with our below market rate home ownership program. I, I say to them, you know, when, when people say, well, it's going to take too long and I don't, I don't think I want to apply. I say, you never know where you're going to be two to three years from now. 
when we potentially call you. Um, you never know what your situation is going to be like when that call might be, you know, you know, a godsend. So it, it's, it's, it's really about applying. And, uh, and so I'll have, um, I will have Sarah put the list for rental units in the chat box as well. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, again, um, we've also put our emails in the chat box. So he's Bill, I'm Robert, he's housing safety, I'm housing, affordable housing. <laughs> Is that, yeah, that, that, that works. Um, <laughs> but if you, if you get it mixed up and you send one of us an email that refers to the other, we will definitely point you in the right direction. Right. Yeah. We'll straighten All right. it out. Um, any final questions? It's been a it's been a good presentation. Good good Q and A. Um, you're welcome, Manjula. Appreciate the questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Here. Okay, uh, Bill. Any final words of wisdom? So much. <laughs> uh, I'm a little short on the wisdom, but all I can say is that um, you know we're we're all looking forward to a. a you know, a, a more beautiful, bright future. And, uh, you know, Godspeed and, and everybody be safe. Well said. So with that, uh, we will end this meeting. If you do have any final questions, I'll give you about 30 seconds to plug them into the chat. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for attending our workshop. We hope you found value. Uh, and, you know, we appreciate you spending a, an hour of your time with us this evening. Um, again, any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here to be a resource. Uh, we, we also look forward to putting on more of these events in the future um, to, to just further our mission to make sure that you feel safe in your homes and to hopefully create more affordable housing uh, here in the city. So um, again, my name is Robert. He's well, Bill. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, Bill. Good job.